like a totally privileged kid who's an engineer who doesn't know the words patriarchy or feminism now is on the 17 day train journey in general dabbas around india with the intent to listen and i was not ready at all because we thought we'll make something funny of 20 minutes kind of a youtube video you know the tvf kind of stuff we'll make that was my understanding at least hey guys welcome to chalchitra talks मेरा नाम दिशा है एंड दिस इज आर गेस्ट एपिसोड विद समर्थ महाजन समर्थ इज अ नॉन फिक्शन फिल्म मेकर हुज मेड सम अमेजिंग फिल्म लाइक काजवा द अनरिजर्व एंड मोस्ट रिसेंटली बॉडीलैंड आई हैड अ लवली कॉन्वर्सेशन विद हिम वे ही गिव मी सम ग्रेट रेकमेंडेशन ऑन अ वेराइटी ऑफ थिंग्स इफ यू न्यू ह्योर वी आर अ रेकमेंडेशन बेस्ड चैनल दट ब्रिंग्स यू सम ऑफ द फाइनेस्ट रेकमेंडेशन ऑन बुक्स म्यूजिक मूवीज एवरी सिंगल वीक So make sure you're subscribed, and with that, let's get into this episode. Hi, Samarth. Welcome to Chal Chitra Talks. Hey, Disha. Thank you for having me here. I'm so excited about our conversation. <laughs> me too. Um, I think uh, one of the recommendations that is fail proof for me is the unreserved. A lot of people have come back to me and told me that they really enjoyed the documentary. So this is very special for me as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. In fact, I think after you recommended it on the channel. I th- I think uh, we had about what forty fifty thousand views and they doubled. I think within oh, a wow. few. So thank you for <laughs> bringing it up in that video. A pleasure, pleasure. <laughs> uh, but um, I also recently happened to see Kazwa, and with that, I think I have seen almost all of your work. And uh, one of the things I noticed is that all three of your documentaries have really great music. and um, i was wondering what uh, process uh, of selection do you follow if at all you do and just in general what music you listen to so i think with the with the selection of music bit uh, it's mostly me and my editor anadi atle you know we are still figuring out our final cut we've not arrived at it and uh, i've been lucky to work with editors who have a very good sense of music so it's usually they who shortlist music or somehow find some music and i think one important thing is we never shy away from finding existing music like for example in unreserved we found a track by indian ocean and yeah. i think uh, the interesting part of the process was like that you know let me write to them let me write to them i am an indie filmmaker i i really like this music will they let me use it uh, and it is something similar that we did in kazwa also because the music is by kartik ayer who usually plays for ar rahman mm-hmm. as a violinist yeah. and even then we were like let's drop a, a soundcloud you know text to him so we've been lucky to you know either be like amateur enough to not think that these are big things because you know sometimes you know more and you get those blocks yeah so so that's how we've gotten our music with borderlands if i have created music for the first time hmm. so there's a lot of baul music uh, and you know dotara as an instrument being used uh, hmm. in uh, borderlands yeah but i think that the process really been like let's uh listen to a lot of music and find rooted music like all these three tracks are very indian in very different ways so that's something we like really crave for like to keep our narratives rooted and use music to not uh, give it a touch which will alienate the audiences mm-hmm. uh, now it when it comes to music it's interesting because apart from you know looking for music for my own films i don't think i listen to a lot of music mm-hmm. but there are certain tracks that i love going back to I think there is this track called Kangal Irandal from Subramanian Puram. I won't even try to attempt if it's a Telugu song or a Tamil song. I'm very sorry, but it's, it's a lovely, uh, lovely romantic song, and I I think I go back to it also because the way it's picturized. It's a village where you know two people like a like a rowdy kind of a man and a very demure kind of a woman. Uh, they start ha- developing a crush on each other. Mm-hmm. And, you know they are shy and typically very towny like small towny things are happening so i really like it uh, there is uh, this uh, recent obsession that i have developed with badsha because <laughs> <laughs> i spent yeah. spent a year in punjab i am actually from punjab and mm-hmm. somehow i have no idea how i just started listening to badsha a lot i think mm-hmm. uh, you know i think he had this track jugnu jugnu yeah 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 really stuck in my head because it had some retro vibes and uh, and again like i think the way it was shot was was pretty nice i think there there's this uh, moroccan band uh, they are called tinari men i really like them i think for for all these things i feel it's mostly the music videos which actually capture my imagination and then the music is an mm-hmm. additional thing oh um, interesting okay yeah. 
like they ha- they have this track called uh, sastana kam and it's actually a documentation of you know there were some kids who were big fans of this band so they wrote to them saying that we want to play for you so the mm-hmm. whole music video is actually this band traveling to this remote village to meet these fans and wow. making them part of the track ah okay so i think it's a documentation of a very uh, moving encounter done in a very nice way but mm-hmm. yeah you see how disconnected these uh, worlds are <laughs> <laughs> you have a diverse taste in music <laughs> uh, yeah. lovely lovely so um are there any books you've been reading lately or just what is your relationship with reading in general i'm more of a movies person only but mm-hmm. with books i have read a lot of books about things that i want to show in my films so for mm-hmm. example with borderlands uh, i think just as preparation i read a lot that people had written for example you know tagore has this uh, book called nationalism mm-hmm. and it's very fascinating to read tagore's thoughts on ideas of nationalism and borders because you know funnily tagore's written the national anthem for india he's yeah. also written the national anthem for for bangladesh Yeah. and the sri lankan national anthem the tune is composed by ravindran like they've taken a ravindra sangeet tune yeah yeah it's just so fascinating to read that this person doesn't believe in the idea of nationalism and mm-hmm. what his ideas of a country are or a community are so i think that kind of a reading i really do so i that book had a profound impact on me mm-hmm. uh and uh, just that atmosphere of the world that is right now you know it it over time has been a slightly right leaning environment mm. a lot of people have been talking about uh, reflecting on you know experiences with the nazi regime so mm. i I've, i've read a lot recently about why does this happen you know mm. there is mm. this very interesting book called the true believer by eric hoffer <laughs> so he just tells about why do people believe Yeah. and uh, i think one thing i really found fascinating was he talks about this excerpt uh, of, of conversation between hitler and his minister of propaganda mm-hmm. i think gobbles and uh, there was a time in german history when it was very dicey that you know like germany could become communist mm-hmm. or fascist it was equally probable mm-hmm. and he to- he tells his minister of propaganda that it's fine it's you know we we should not target uh, people who do not have an opinion we should actually target people who believe in communism because it's easier to convert a believer than a person who doesn't care ah and okay. and that i see for i for me it's like contextualizing it to india for example you know we like from a very uh, liberal uh, regime we are into a conservative regime all of a sudden uh, mm-hmm. and uh, and it's just about like people wanting to believe no one wants to be directionless we want a leader it doesn't matter humko kahan le ja raha hai kahin le ja raha hai koi to hai so so i think i found that book very interesting of late i've been working around uh, a lot around mafia which is a departure from my previous work but i've been doing some ott projects around mafia so i've been okay. reading a lot of hussein zaidi will this be a fictional work or non fiction no there is also non fiction i'm okay. i'm working with vice studios on one oh, wow. uh-huh. and mm-hmm. the other series i think is still in so much infancy that you know uh, like i think with time it <laughs> it will be possible to talk about it much but mm-hmm. uh, this project that i did with vice was all about mafia so mm-hmm. lot of hussein zaidi uh, i have in fact read some and uh, some of it is still on its way reaching me every day you know mm-hmm. uh, so that's something that i've been reading that's on the books print uh interesting so this research process for you um what all sources do you go to do you watch videos movies or everything or is there anything specific that you like to go to so i think a lot of people avoid uh, you know academic journals hmm. which is which which sounds very unglamorous and boring but hmm. uh, at least with the kind of documentaries i am doing for example borderlands we found a lot of fascinating research which anthropologists and sociologists would be doing which is not very typical for i think uh, if you're aiming at a very mainstream narrative then you're going to jstor jstor is like this yeah. database of lakhs of academic papers so i think that is something that i uh, feel we tapped in a lot for borderlands at least like at least three of the stories have come from journals and we've met academics we've met mm-hmm. these professors who are teaching at yale ortis and mm-hmm. these are all fascinating people they are storytellers on all the their 
their storytelling may be slightly sterile but mm-hmm. uh, it has seeds of emotions which i feel uh, can be extracted then yes lot of reading on internet happens uh, random reading we meet a lot of journalists because we also feel uh, people only write about maybe 10% of their experience mm-hmm. so a lot of reading and then meeting journalists for real one thing i try to do personally is you know some people advise do not watch similar stuff and don't shade yourself i love watching similar stuff like when we made kazwa i searched the whole web for anything made on fireflies because i wanted to make sure that our attempt was unique mm. uh, same with unreserved and uh, we found some fascinating documentaries from china from us it just allowed me to also believe that whatever lens i am bringing in is unique and maybe mm. i can also be inspired and i don't mind being inspired like you remember in unreserved there's this whole sequence of people asleep towards the end yeah. Yeah. right so there's this uh, documentary called uh, iron ministry hmm. there's a thing called sensory ethnography lab at harvard university now hmm. harvard's producing some very fascinating ethnographic documentaries so iron hmm. ministry was this film about trains in china hmm. main difference being they've not interviewed people it's a very distant objective observational view of the chinese so like place. a fly on the wall type of precisely mm-hmm. precisely it's fly on the wall but they had this very fascinating sequence of people just asleep and in that film it's the slow film that sequence goes on for 10 minutes i feel mm-hmm. uh, but i think we got that idea and it really fitted in well it allowed us to close the film in a very beautiful way i feel mm-hmm. so watching films is very important reading is important journals are important we try to read books also but i think in my experience we relied more on more on journalistic pieces on web and journals yeah that's mm-hmm. how the research process goes but uh, obviously a lot of it changes the moment we are on ground so there's an online on laptop on zoom calls research and then mm-hmm. there's the research where we are actually in a village meeting a sarpanch at a not for profit meeting the founders waiting for them to introduce us to potential characters mm-hmm. and and that research i think completely changes many things like it can turn your story upside down completely were you ever worried that things would be lost in translation especially with borderlands definitely definitely but i think that's why we one before we even went to the recce we found people so i recruited ad's for uh, bengali nepali and manipuri so in mm-hmm. every every phase and these were different phases so i would at least make sure ki ek phase pe ek hi ad rahe because the complexity otherwise is too much so we mm. shot bengal in a different phase we came back to bombay saw the footage shot nepal came back and then we shot manipur so i would talk to about 10 12 people i would float this email also posted on social media that we are looking for people to engage in emotional conversations heartfelt conversations because that's the role you need to talk you need to talk your heart out that's the role right yeah and yeah. then would meet them and they would recce with us oh so okay even during recce it's they who are building their relationships because i know i don't want a translator because mm-hmm. in the whole act of translation and you've seen interviewing and conversations are very integral parts of at least my approach yeah so the moment there's a translator you and i cannot connect directly yeah. so the role was very clear for these associate directors that you are going to lead the story these are your characters also these are your friends mm-hmm. and uh, so that was one way that we reduced this lost in translation thing because even on the recce you know there's obviously this induction period where initially they are they are not sure they are hesitant then either they cry or i shout sometimes this also happens but ultimately you come on the same page on the shoot what we would do is whenever there's an interview and i wouldn't sit in the interviews and we don't even have questionnaires because we are like ye broad story hai kisi ki zindagi ko panch hisson mein divide kar do and then let's try to explore what people like to talk about what what are what are they saying they want to talk about that's mm-hmm. why there's a lot of new information in the interviews mm-hmm. uh, but when the interviews done we come back and our associate directors would translate everything to us ki ye baat hui hai for okay. example we did we do an interview in bengal for example noor's story which is in a shelter home for rescued women so yeah. she, like joyuna who was our associate director she interviews we come back in the hotel we freshen mm-hmm. up chill get our energy back 
and then we would sit for 3 4 hours to deconstruct that one hour interview hmm. and then we would find out okay has this interview worked out and if it has worked out what should we shoot alongside it now that this is the story so footage review becomes very important because the editor now editor doesn't have visibility so huh. we also got a lot of volunteers hmm. and this is my process because we had run out of budgets so again I, on social media i just posted we are looking for volunteers to translate one hour of footage so for example we had 20 hours of footage from bengal hmm. so we got um, 40 volunteers and two different volunteers uh, translated the same one hour basically so we got those transcripts for the editor so that it's not lost in translation for him okay that's that's lovely to know because i was always when i was watching the documentary that is something that struck me immensely but as you rightly said um, interactions with people and raw interactions are a very big part of what you do have you uh, managed to figure out what is something that you can say to people that will enable them to be honest and open with you now i think it's most about what you don't say like you know mm-hmm. uh, sometimes people say politically incorrect things and we tend to correct them or we want to impose our ideas on people mm-hmm. i think those are the parts where people become really wary that you know should i open up to this person or you know this person is actually policing me so we try and not do that and i think uh, it's important to meet people before you start shooting with them and you want to go in with the camera directly at least so for example obviously with unreserved we had to go in with the camera because that was the process but you imagine you live in a border area someone's come from bombay and with a camera they directly want to enter you your house so yeah. obviously you will be uncomfortable so i think one very important thing is how do you gain access who introduces you to the characters mm-hmm. so if they trust that person and if that person is introducing us implicitly they give us some trust they are ready yeah. to sit with us and then it's more most about uh, your intentions what are you trying to do with the film so we had to explain to people this is not a facebook live we are not from a news channel then it's more about them understanding your intention with the project and then just flowing with the process but in in the unreserved because the camera was always there there we had a slightly different process because there there the, i think the process was me smiling creepily at people and then just seeing who smiles back and then just asking them where are they going and starting a conversation from there it's the easiest thing to start conversation within a train aap kahan ja rahe hain kyun ja rahe hain and if the conversation became into something at some point i would say ki acha hum ek film bhi bana rahe hain would you mind giving me an interview bahut maza aa raha hai aapse baat karke so yeah. i think it's it's more about eye contact smile just listening to them and not telling them ki aap galat bol rahe ho like lot of people in unreserved as well as borderland they say things which i personally don't believe in right mm. uh, mm. there's this uh, guy a father you know there's a family in unreserved where the mother has yeah. diabetes yeah yeah fathers so directly like ki mujhe to ladka chahiye i i want a guy and the mothers also like ki ek ladka to hone hi chahiye now as problematic as these thoughts are uh i think the the decision that we made was we will not cut them we will listen to them and try and understand interesting and why documentaries and why not fictional filmmaking so there are layers to it one is basically when i came to bombay mm-hmm. i actually started out as a second ad on a fiction film which i left within 4 days because i totally did not enjoy being a second ad and it was very bad work and i don't want to take names but you know people from bollywood were involved but uh, mm-hmm. i think ultimately the role was very non creative mm. and uh, then i met ashay gangwar who runs camera and shots who produced a lot of my work and he's from the same college we both come from iit kharagpur and uh, we talked because he was also just starting out in films in bombay we went to this place called bottles in versova we had some beer and we decided to work together because mostly there's nothing uh you know that was that seemed to be the simplest way of starting to make films he wanted to produce i wanted to direct yeah and uh he was a cinematographer and he was interested in documentaries and camera and shots as a production house is all documentaries so at that point for me it was just uh, i think uh, with with my flow i was like okay let's try documentaries because i didn't have an affinity ashe had mm-hmm. and ashe could shoot i didn't even know how to shoot i still don't know i don't I always have a cinematographer I always have an editor my technical skill set is zero yeah 
Yeah. So that's how it started. But I think when I started making nonfiction, and especially I think after Unreserved, not mm-hmm. so much about not not so much after Kazwa, but Unreserved was a transformative process for me, because you can imagine like a totally privileged kid who's an engineer who doesn't know the words patriarchy or feminism, now is on this seventeen day train journey in general dabbas around India, with the intent to listen, and I was not ready. at all because we thought we'll make something funny of 20 minutes kind of a youtube video you know the tvf kind of stuff we'll make that was my mm. understanding at least mm. and uh, the moment people started talking because you know i had no idea people had so much to tell and so much emotional baggage people carry with themselves and yet manage to just you know carry on with it and some of the conversations were very heavy obviously coming back editing it looking at it from a third person's point of view then uh, mm-hmm. it was something which really moved me and okay then i realized okay non fiction is very interesting because we can talk about people who wouldn't make it to uh, netflix or an amazon prime or a theater you know mm-hmm. these are people who are i call them everyday people but if you look at it from a commercial perspective they're nobody people because mm-hmm. they are considered to be nobodies right yeah and that somehow started fueling me that you know these are these are narratives which would never get captured probably so i had some stories which i thought i could tell better because i had done it once and i enjoyed the process of just listening to people who are not celebrities because they i don't think they come with any air around them so the connection is very genuine and i get to travel like uh, with borderlands i think half the excitement was that okay we'll go to all the borders of india we'll just go to all the extreme parts and i think if you see dholi's story which is literally at the border something like that you know if if you yeah. feel it it stays with you so i think over time non fiction sort of become a passion you can say although i still believe i want to do fiction and there are ideas and i don't want to stick to this but it's something which allows me to talk to people travel so it's fun Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Also, I can imagine that there must have been a lot of impactful conversations that didn't make it to any of these uh, documentaries. For Borderlands, I think uh, one very moving story that you know it happened in the beginning, so we weren't sure how to shoot it. It mm-hmm. couldn't make it to the edit because it was just shot differently compared to rest of the film. And this was in Gujarat. Uh, so what happens in Gujarat is a lot of fishermen from Gujarat they venture into Pakistani waters. because there's mm-hmm. more fish there yeah and uh, this is near the daman diu area mm-hmm. and in in kutch the opposite happens like pakistani fishermen come into indian waters because there's more fish here mm-hmm. so uh, we have this very funny relationship with pakistan where some of their fishermen are in our jails our fishermen are in their jails and mm-hmm. if it's eid pakistan will say okay it's eid we will send 500 of your fishermen back and if it's diwali We'll be like, अरे आज दिवाली है हम पांच सौ आपके भेज रहे हैं एंड फिशरमैन सॉर्ट ऑफ बिकम आई डोंट नो वॉट दे बिकम सम सॉर्ट ऑफ कैडबरी का डब्बा इन दिस होल थिंग सो वी वेंट टू गुजरात टू एक्सप्लोर दिस स्टोरी एंड वी फाउंड अ फैमिली पेट्री आर्क सो टू से और दू नो फादर ऑफ दिस गाय वॉज इन पाकिस्तान and uh, i think a lot of them loved tobacco so they also developed cancer so mm-hmm. he had cancer so he basically passed away in the pakistani jail mm-hmm. and the process of uh, bringing back that body was very complicated mm-hmm. and we started talking to this man who basically found out that he's lost his father maybe one or two days before and the whole pain of not being able to be able to see him immediately or why is it so complicated for his body to come back and he was talking to us in hindi otherwise in that village we found it very difficult to talk to people in hindi everyone was talking in gujarati and uh, i asked him like okay, if if he prefers talking in hindi and he talked about how uh, he's talking in hindi because none of his other family people know about this oh okay wow okay so that moment stayed with me like that moment was very powerful because he is the older son in the family and he knows everything and journalists know like there journalists coming talking to him but rest mm-hmm. of the family is slightly unaware and mostly women and he's just sitting there telling that actually i can't talk in gujarati with you so so that was very powerful and uh, we couldn't have that moment in the film because we just didn't shoot it 
hmm. in a in a more coherent way compared to the film hmm. so so that's there but there's so many like, there are so many instances i'll tell you something less grim which was fun hmm. we shot this in bengal there's this village called chor meghna hmm. now when we see the border fence we imagine that okay the fence is the border but the actual border is a kilometer away into the from the fence fence is built at a slight distance from the actual border mm-hmm. okay. so what happens because of this is some villages are beyond the fence mm-hmm. like this is the border fence the village is like indian village is actually beyond the fence it has an open side towards bangladesh acha and actually sees the fence towards india yeah. <laughs> so every day they get locked out of the country for 12 hours because this fence gate is shut from 6 pm to 6 am so it's crazy right yeah. imagine imagine being in this village and obviously there are no amenities very less amenities and in the whole village at one tv that too they had done some katya bazi and found that uh, cable ka connection acha so so we met a couple there hmm. uh, the the border at this village is actually a river like so you see the fence they see the village and the border is actually the river so a lot of uh, bangladeshi uh, women they come to the river to wash the clothes hmm. indian women also go and there are people playing football around like men so one indian guy fell in love with a bangladeshi woman because hmm. the, the woman used to come and wash her clothes at her side of the bank and this guy used to play football and then uh-huh. they got married uh huh and then they went to the bsf to tell them the border security force that now we are married she has come to india now she is an indian yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> so like and then they just started living together like she just shifted you know you can't formalize in such anomalous geographies so mm-hmm. that also i really like like a cross border love story of a village which is actually in such a anomalous geographical location yeah but yeah it, it was a very complex story to tell i think this whole idea of just explaining geographically what is happening uh it required a lot of information which we didn't have and i i was not keen at all to have voice over did you feel frustrated that such beautiful stories were left out well i've gotten used to it uh-huh. i think with with my editor i think so i really like my editor he's very zen and i yeah. think it's mostly from him that i am like if he's zen then i should probably be zen kind of a zone definitely it is sometimes heartbreaking but kya kar sakte hain we can't obsess over it i am very pragmatic that way i am like okay this is the constraint of time this is the constraint of budget mm-hmm. and i have this let me make the best of it and then it's an intellectual debate between me and the editor like i really obsessed over the gujarat story yeah. and he cut it for me he cut it for me in like three different ways but it's not working i also know so after mm-hmm. the point i have to give up and um, the only way we can continue film making is to accept certain failure so to say and move on right with the bit full of that so those stories are just for you and the crew <laughs> and you <laughs> and now me and uh, all of our viewers yeah. listening to all these interesting stories is really making me want to ask you about travel recommendations in india okay travel recommendations in india that's interesting see i think in terms of cities i love calcutta mm-hmm. i think uh, that city has a unique flavor which is uh you know call me a romantic or call me a leftist also but that city is slightly untainted by markets you know this free markets malls everywhere shops everywhere you can still get uh, a chai for 2 rupees in a kullar at some places in that city and i think that's beautiful i think i cannot live in calcutta but if you want a one week break from everything you can go to calcutta and there's a lot of uh, beautiful cafes building i think just walking around in calcutta looking at buildings which may fall at any time but yeah. there is a certain charm to that whole uh, architecture and the way the city is uh, just unplanned i feel it's just totally unplanned mm. so i really like calcutta in terms of my film making i think i we went to this place called nargaon it's not really a tourist place so this event right which we captured milan bazaar which happened yeah. and only one year where uh, it's like the pila baishak it happens on 14th or 15th april mm-hmm. and people from both sides of the border on india and bangladesh for 6 hours precisely are allowed to come near the fence and say happy new year to each mm-hmm. other i mm-hmm. think 
once in a lifetime i think i i to experienced it much quickly because we were making a film and it's yeah. in the film uh i think if more people can experience it i think the toxicity around borders will go and i think that that feeling is surreal to see people very tangibly divided by borders you know obviously bajrangi bhaijaan wagaira mein dikhate hain but that's all created right mm-hmm. and this is so real and people using people sending gifts to each other uh, mm-hmm. which was very surprising to us because i thought that people are just going to cry but they were actually smiling sending gifts to each other i think that was very moving there is a place uh, called deoria deoria mm-hmm. in uttar pradesh okay and uh, i went there as part of this pan india train journey i think i i can suggest people who are younger i think younger than 30 and especially younger than 25 there is this pan india train journey called jagriti yatra it's a 14 day train journey which begins from bombay and they take you to 10 or 12 different locations around india they do this golden quadrilateral kind of a thing from bombay they'll go to bangalore and chennai then mm-hmm. they'll go to odisha then they'll go to delhi and come back to bombay but on this journey you'll go to 14 places out of which one is deoria mm-hmm. where you'll meet social entrepreneurs and mm-hmm. look at what is happening on the grassroots what is happening uh, in the development sector and that journey for me was very very moving and mm-hmm. the places and people i saw on that journey uh, were fascinating i feel because every location would be one very interesting model of social innovation Mm. So it's a different kind of travel. I feel like it's it is more about living in this train and sleeper compartment with four hundred different people, right? Yeah. Of very diverse backgrounds, and uh-huh. then then just exploring India in a very uh, different way because you're looking at India through the lens of how do we actually build this nation, right? Mm. Yeah. So that I think if people really want a travel recommendation, then explore Jagriti Yatra. Try and go on this Yatra and. you just go to interesting places was this before the unreserved or after yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so before this was, oh. this was five years before unreserved and uh-huh. i think i was deeply influenced by this journey because it was one it was in trains it mm-hmm. was in sleeper class but even before we shot the film uh, we were posting about the journey on social media so mm-hmm. we had a twitter thread which sort of went viral when we were traveling in march 2016 mm-hmm. and the first photo we put up was the map Mm. and all my jagriti yatra friends were like oh you're doing the jagriti yatra again <laughs> and i'm like yes this time i'm doing it in the general dabba ah <laughs> uh, okay yeah <laughs> nice 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 so uh, coming to documentaries this is i think uh, going to be the most interesting part of this video i would love to get some documentary recommendations from you i want to start from india mm. like uh, you know films division i think a lot of people have heard about it and i think i am 20 this uh, documentary has gone viral over mm-hmm. you know the last few months i am 20 was actually made in 1967 and mm-hmm. films division had commissioned few films to reflect on 20 years of india mm-hmm. so out of those films there is another film called an indian day mm-hmm. india 67 it's another name for this film india 67 and uh, it's more commonly known as an indian day it's by a filmmaker called s sukhdev mm-hmm. and i think it's one of the rare poetic documentaries from india you know we've we've heard about films like koyanis katsi baraka samsara which mm-hmm. are feats of cinematography but there is this humble indian film which has no dialogue it's one hour long and it's just about seeing india so they are through without dialogues trying to tell you the story of india which is very complex and i think this film also really had inspired me this whole pan india thing no like with under the yeah. borderlands this fascination with doing something which gives you a kaleidoscopic view of the country so that film is uh, like that and i think it's available on youtube in one of the sequences the filmmaker meets his mother and that had really been with me and uh, you know sort of and i ended up shooting with my mother in borderlands i think i attribute attribute that to s sukhdev to some extent there is this uh, film called please vote for me so i also teach now so hmm. i teach documentaries and i think the first film i love showing to people is either please vote for me or salam cinema please vote for me is a chinese documentary it's about three third graders hmm. in communist china hmm. trying to fight a democratic election to become the class monitor oh, okay interesting and it's deeply 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 fascinating because <laughs> you see these what seven six year old seven year old chinese kids 
and then the class teacher introduces that okay this time we're going to do it in a democratic way and what happens you know this kind of strategies that they use to beat each other and what do you learn about democracy ultimately which is actually something not very different from what we see playing out in democracy so mm-hmm. I, this is a beautiful documentary it was produced by bbc it went on to get nominated for oscars freely available on youtube again this other film salam cinema this is an iranian film by mohsen makmalbaf and uh, again the the idea itself is so fascinating that you know it's the 100 years of cinema mm-hmm. and uh, mohsen makmalbaf says okay so asal hue main film banaunga ek film banaunga about cinema salam cinema and uh, he gives an ad in a newspaper that i am going to audition people for this film huh. so i think 20000 people turn up for auditions that's the opening scene like there are endless endless rows of people there for the audition and that just puts you in this context of how much love iranians have for cinema which i wasn't aware of before watching this film i mm. watched this film much before watching anything from kirustami or jafar panahi mm-hmm. and uh, at that point uh, mohsen makmal buff says okay let me make the film about the auditions okay so, <laughs> so it's a film about the auditions mm-hmm. and uh, it's very playful because obviously people are confused because they are told that whatever you're doing as part of the audition is your role and you do feel like the thing that iranian filmmakers love doing is they love crossing boundaries between fiction and non fiction keeps on happening kirustami does it panahi does it and i think even in this film you'll feel like ye sab to real nahi hai kuch to script kiya hai inhone but but that's part of the fun of that film right i think uh, if i have to add one more uh, yeah. recommendation uh, there is this animated short doc and uh, i find it fascinating that there are animated documentaries because it sounds oh, yeah. comedic but there is this film called the shining star of losers everywhere Oh yeah, love that one. Ah <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's it's a short doc about this horse Hara Urara, who keeps on losing, right? But in his losing spree, he becomes a symbol of inspiration for Japan while it's going through depression. So it's it's very powerful. Uh, the the narrative, even though this horse is losing again and again, the film is so hopeful. I think it's very rare to make that kind of a narrative. Lovely, and uh, coming to fiction. any recommendations on that and tv shows movies whatever for sure for sure i'm not much of a tv show person mm. although i love black mirror like i love dark humor in general mm. so black black mirror has that so does uh, i think love death and robots so mm-hmm. these are two shows i really like because they're dark but they're funny in terms of uh, fiction i think kirustami's koker trilogy i think it's one of the most humane works that i've seen and i also love how the films are connected right uh, mm-hmm. so the, the first film which is uh, where is my friend's home is about a kid trying to return the homework copy to his friend because he thinks that if he doesn't do that the teacher is going to beat him right mm-hmm. which i feel is very tender and uh, the way it's shot some of the shots are just iconic and people keep on giving homage to that film and the second film which was and life goes on is inspired by the real life earthquake that happened in the village where the first film was shot mm. so so this film is about a filmmaker going to this earthquake stricken village to find out what happened to his protagonists mm. it's like going into the meta layer of where is the friend's home and uh, the third film which is through the olive trees what happens in the second film is that okay there is this earthquake stricken village So there's a scene between a married couple who've recently gotten married amidst the earthquake, and the message is that you know life goes on, right? Marriages do happen, and the third film is totally based on this scene, because they show in the third film that a crew was shooting the second film. Ah, oh, okay. So what was actually going on, like on camera in the second part of the series? These people are a couple, hmm. but what are they actually? So I think uh, it's not much of a spoiler, but the guy is sort of head head over heels for the girl. The girl is not interested, but they're shooting this as a couple. And the whole film is again, it's extremely funny, and it tells you so much about uh, human nature. So yeah. this, series, I think, if people can watch this series, it will deeply move them and expose them to the magic of Iranian cinema before even you know people like Asghar Farhadi or this. I think even before Panahi, Panahi used to assist. 
Kurosami and he is there in the second part. Like you can see him as part of the crew. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this I really like. I think uh, if I have to mention two more films, Bhuvan Shom by Mrinal Sen. And this is a film I recently saw. It's I think one of his earlier works, and it's in Hindi, not Bengali, because mm-hmm. you know, usually we attach uh, Satyajit Ray, yeah. Mrinal Sen, Ghatak, all Bengali filmmakers. But Bhuvan Shom is so fresh. Even now, I think it's been fifty-five years since it's oh. been made. And it has uh, Utpal Dutt and Suhasini Mule, and Suhasini Mule, our generation knows, or at least my generation knows, because she was the mother in Lagan. And uh, it's so fresh. It's the story of this uh, Gujarati bureaucrat who's very sadu. He's extremely sadu, but he goes on a hunt, and then he gets into all kinds of problems, and then he meets this young girl who's full of life, and the amount of uh, experimentation and form that is at display in this film. I think films in India don't do that. you know mm-hmm. this animation there is this shot of suhasni mule on a swing she is swinging mm-hmm. and the camera is swinging with her in charu lata the camera is swinging from the point of view of the character on the swing but here you know the camera is far away from the swing but it's still swinging and it creates some very different kind of a delirious kind of an effect that you are also swinging mm-hmm. so those kind of things are very nice about this film when shown and uh, I think I really like this film called Underground. It's by this uh, Serbian filmmaker Emir Kusturica. And I think what I like about his films in general and this film in particular is that one he creates his own music, so he has extreme control over music. And I mm-hmm. think I have heard a lot of his OST. If it comes to music, I keep on uh, looping this film's OST also. There is a song called Kalashni Kov. which mm-hmm. is i think the craziest dance party kind of music the choreography of the camera or the movement of the actors it just seems like dance and uh, there is this other layer that this film is a parable for uh, yugoslavia's partition so mm-hmm. yugoslavia got partitioned at some point and yeah. this whole film is an allegory to that so as an indian uh, i am able to connect to some of the themes and then there is magic realism kasturika loves magic realism so there is this uh, whole idea that uh, you know if 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 both of us are friends and i want to be the leader of this country this new country that is being born i'll convince you to go underground that's where the name underground comes from uh-huh. and you trust me you trust me so you take it so seriously that you go underground literally and you build a new society which lives underground which doesn't know what happens on the ground Hmm. And I keep on visiting you and telling you that, brother, abhi abhi bhi sahi nahi hua hai. Tum yehi raho. But at some point, you figure out that you know you were tricked. Uh huh. So, very interesting film. I think this film won the Palm de Or in nineteen ninety five. So in the festival, people bhi unko bhi achhi lagegi. Commercial bhi hai, music bhi acha hai. So. Lovely, lovely. I have been on your Instagram quite a few times, and I've noticed you give a lot of food recommendations. So, us pe kuch agar recommendations ho to. Done, done. I'll I'll give you food recommendation, and I'll hope for my health also because I've been eating too much. <laughs> But this dish can only be had in Calcutta or Bombay. Uh, it's called no no lane gure rice cream, and uh, in Calcutta it's common. Like hmm. I think no lane gure is palm jaggery, and in, in Bombay there's this just one outlet of. this chain called pabrais p a b r a i apostrophe s pabrais mm. and they are in varsova mm. so if you can please try nolen gure ice cream because you're going to remember it apart from that i think in terms of food i love uh, like chingdi malai curry and dab chingdi these are again bengali dishes uh, but uh, they are very interesting like dab chingdi usually the presentation is in a coconut and it's uh-huh. a coconut curry of prawns I really like it, and I I also think they cook prawn malai curry very well. I recently tried uh, this uh, Taj ice cream also in uh, mm-hmm. Bohri Mohalla in uh, Bendi. Like if you go to South Bombay, Mohammad Ali Road is very famous. Yeah. But there is this Bohri Mohalla also, uh, mm-hmm. and it's a developed area now. Like they recently developed it, and uh, so you have a lot of shops there. And there is this place called Taj Ice Cream, which has been making ice cream since eighteen eighty seven, and there is something called Guava Ice Cream. Okay. Guava ice cream, which you know you have with chili powder. Ha ha ha. Thanks. Because now I'm on an ice cream spree. I'm gonna give you one more ice cream thing in Delhi this time. Uh, oh. And in in Delhi, there's this place called Kuremal Mohan Lal, very close to the Chawri Bazar metro station. It is Old Delhi, and hmm. they have jamun ice cream. 
Oh. And that again, they give it with some masala. So it's different from your generic sweet ice cream. Like it's masala that ice cream. You know, I've just mm-hmm. gone on this ice cream spree. So you have Kuriamal Mohanlal in Delhi. You have Pabrai's in Kolkata, but they also have a branch in Bombay. So you can actually have it here. And then there's Taj ice cream, which gives crazy guava ice cream. And then uh, I think if I have to go to the holy grail of all dishes, the Makkah of my food world, it is Aslam butter chicken. It is in Chavri Bazaar only. It's in the Matiya Mahal Bazaar in front of Jama Masjid. Mm. Aslam butter chicken. If you want to experience bliss, if you want to see there's Allah, there's Ram, and everyone will come together. It is at Aslam butter chicken. They give the craziest butter chicken, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you. So before we end this conversation, is there anything you would like to plug? Just root for us. I think we've made a film right borderlands uh, we've spent four years making it and now we are screening it across cities so we are screening in calcutta on 31st we are screening in hyderabad on 3rd we are screening in bangalore on 10th in goa on 11th in pune on 18th in baroda on 24th so mm-hmm. on and so forth follow our page like film borderlands is on instagram and you will get to know where we are physically off to next and hopefully through all these physical screenings, some digital people will also notice the film because we've been trying to pedal it for some time. But we've had some very interesting screenings at Harkat Studios in NCPA in Ahmedabad. So I'm looking forward to more uh, physical screenings, interacting with audiences after the uh, shows. Yeah, please, please follow Chalchitra Talks. If you want to get the latest on, you know, what are the great films to watch? What are the great books to read? interesting food to eat, especially ice creams. <laughs> Please subscribe to Chalchitra Talks. I've been following the channel for, I think, more than a year now. And I have found a lot of uh, value in terms of just the diversity of recommendations that come up. So kudos to you. And I would really urge all my followers to you know, follow Chalchitra Talks also.